In the mid 80s, I was in my early teens li living in London and I had come down to India for a short break uh, visiting my then grandmother who was still alive. And while I was in India, I would often go and look uh, for what's happening socially in the country. And I remember picking up one of these sort of glamorous magazines and looking at a certain page where there were photographs of various celebrities uh, attending various parties. And my eye caught upon an individual who I knew there was something different about her. Okay. And when I read about her and I got to know about who this person was, it was a transgender lady who in the mid 80s was out there flamboyantly celebrating her identity. So in those days, let alone India, even in the West, I mean, coming out as being gay or trans uh, wasn't as open as it is in today's day and age. But what struck me at that moment was, wow, this individual must be so brave to come out at that time and celebrate her identity as a transgender lady and not only come out but celebrate it with the world around her. I, that always struck me as being so brave of this individual. Over the years, I lost, you know, touch and interest. I didn't know who she was. I knew her name and I knew that she lived in New Delhi. But it was only recently that through a friend of mine called Vandana Vadera that I got to know that v Vandy and this individual were very good friends. And I said to Vandy, you know, I would love to podcast her about her journey and her life. And thank you, Vandy, for setting it up. And I remember one night I was out here in Singapore with my wife on a date and I had a phone call and I knew this was the individual's number. So I excused myself because I just had to take this call. I came out of the restaurant and I actually had a fanboy moment, not believing that I was actually speaking to this individual. And I don't usually have fanboy moments at all. can't remember the last time it happened to me. But I'm so glad I got to talk to this person. She put, she put me at ease with her sweetness, her, her sense of just being a human being. And I'm so grateful that I could actually be a part of this person's life. And she was a part of mine in that moment. And I'm so happy that she spoke to us. So to all of you, meet Sylvie Rogers, a diva, a queen in her own right. And she talks to us about what it's like being one of India's first transgender individuals to come out and celebrate it, to own it what she went through and where she is right now. Let's talk. Hello, 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 and this is Tagore, and welcome to my podcast, A Pint of Imbecile Wisdom. Today with, with me is somebody that I've heard of when I was a teenager, and I've looked up to this person. Okay. Not for the things that this person represents, but there's a very <coughs> personal story in here, which I'm so touched emotionally about talking. So my guest uh, is what we call in India an Anglo-Indian. What I mean by that, for those of you who might not know, is the my guest's mother was from India. In fact, from Goa, where I come from. And her father was uh, from the Netherlands, a Dutch person. They grew up in Kolkata. Um, and uh, circumstances led the family to be split as the father went back to Holland and uh, leaving uh, his wife and five children behind. The family back in India were quite poor. Uh, they didn't have any luxuries in life. But my guest being the eldest of the family, um, the eldest child rather, was very good academically. And the state government sponsored a sponsorship for my guest to go to England and pursue an MBBS and become a doctor, which my my guest did, went to uh, England, became a became a certified doctor, worked in the hospital as a nurse. At the same time, pursued becoming a general surgeon, but all the blood and all the cutting 
was getting to her till one fine day she saved her money and decided to go back to go to America for a year where she ended up actually doing short courses in things like uh, stitching fashion design uh hair styling and even carpentry but it was there that from a land of conservative england my guest found herself in the land of freedom started going to all the right parties uh, some of them were gay parties and and that's when the curiosity that she had all the time along actually made sense and she found her sexuality in the late 18 uh, 1980s she came back to india not as a doctor but as a well well respected uh hair designer a hair stylist and immediately became india's most high demanded hair stylist and a page 3 celebrity in her own right so that's all what i want to talk to you about those silvi am i right in all that i have said so far about you yes it is taught on everything was very very right there was no um nothing added there was nothing less it was all factuals it's all factuals and uh, i don't think you left out anything it was perfectly said thank you you know what a moment for me i know just to be talking to you silvi what a moment now there's two things that i want to talk to you about you know people that we have in common have said there's something addictive about you and that is that you are a fountain of happiness not only within yourself but to everybody around you 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 take it upon yourself to make sure that everybody around you in your life or whatever it may be is happy and we'll come to that in the second half of the podcast my first thing i want to talk to you is of obviously being a transgender woman you were one of the very first if not the first person who came out in india and actually celebrated celebrated who you are can you tell me a little bit about that um so many years ago you know so 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 many years ago it's uh, i'm kind of ancient now but the problem is that um, i never came out as such to god i was always out as in i went about things uh, very normally as i kept growing up and kept you know uh, moving on with my life as a child as a school boy and um, i just kept on moving the way i thought it was natural for me obviously not for the outside world which i didn't know which i was most innocent to and uh, i kept moving on my own terms and my own um, rights when i did find something different when i said different mean different to other boys i was in a hostel in a uh, in a in a you know charitable school where we were sponsored by america and england and london Uh, all our fees at the Irish Missionary School, so we were brought up by all our Irish nuns and priests, and it was a, a convent-educated school, St Paul's Mission School. And the fact remains that uh, so the word you never heard the word gay or homosexual or whatever, whatever. It's when I only left school and joined college, then I got to know that there is something different about me. But the fact remains is that um, I didn't. Uh, go against the nature of my uh, of my uh, being i just went with the flow i just thought i am a woman i am a woman i am a woman but each time i looked into the mirror and i had to have a bath without the other boys in the bathroom i raised a no i'm in the boy school so these things kept playing up you know with me and i one day sat my mother down and i asked her and she knew everything being a gone very poor gone woman very simple catholic very orthodox catholic woman and i asked her and she said no you are very normal everything is right with you nothing is wrong why do you feel like that i said because the boys call me names they call me girly they call me moga they call me you know all names which i don't understand of course at those days so it was not really that i came out uh, my mother said you do what you want to do you are my child if you want to wear a skirt you wear a skirt if you want to if there are different when i was going to college If you want to wear a dress, you wear a dress, but add dignity to it. Don't wear it like the people like eunuchs. So there was a big difference when she made it clear to me that a eunuch is different and you are different. Then I asked her, I said, "What is what is different about it? What, what where am I?" She said, "No, this is normal. Many people are, are feminine. It's okay. You wear a dress if you want to wear a dress. I'm your mother. Now I don't object to it. It's okay with me." 
so my mother kind of was my backbone and she stood by me in the in those years i'm talking about the 80s when i went to uh, you know 1979 i finished my schooling at uh, 77 and i went to college in 78 so you can imagine in the late 70s early 80s uh it was a very different era it was a very period era so uh it was very difficult to get to understand my own character i didn't know and i didn't get complex bit and i didn't feel wrong till till i got into college and when all the halla bulla started and all the you know the three bricks and bracks and all the humiliation and it was terrible it was the worst part of my life my college life was the worst part of my life because then i realized of my as to what i really was then i said i'm not going back i'm going to dress the way i want to dress i would to be the way i want to be i'm going to do what i want to do it's my life no one's paying my bills no one's doing anything for me i might as well do it so that's how it started this and this was in england in college right no this was in st xavier's calcutta in the beginning oh okay, this was in in india itself yeah but after a very short period there because by that time i was a, i was a year there only by that time my admission had come through in essex for my male nursing and i had to leave to london so what was england like in the late 70s for for someone i didn't even went to england it was 81 i was about uh, 80 88 and 89 i was in college half of 88 and half of 89 by the end of that i had gone to england it was very orthodox let me be honest the british were very they had their noses up their asses they were very <laughs> very 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 you know, snooty and uh, people like us even the english people even the english gay men were looked down upon and it was not very comfortable for them either you know they had to camouflage their looks with beards and things like that and coming out as a queen was disastrous in london in the 80s i remember and that time the hippie era had just come out i remember and uh, uh, you know it was all that hippie era was all that you know you grow hair long and you know and you look different you look different so some of them covered up by trying to look like hippies but you know in my college being a medical college it, there was a lot of conservativeness over there it was there it was evident it was there so many doctors were there which i only realized in my third year but i was a male nurse i started as a male nurse and i realized oh my god they are all like me but you could not even smell it it was so conservative okay so then obviously i talked about you going to america and having a ball of a time with all these parties that uh, you know we won't go into but, but that was the turning point in your life because you kind of discovered or you were able to point your finger down as to what was happening with you right because you found liberated there correct yes yeah in those times america was much more freer uh, much more liberated than uh, the english people uh, uh, american never bothered what you were what you looked like so that's the time when i thought now it's time to change my personality you know i've already become a doctor i've worked as a doctor i've done my deal as a doctor looking like a horrible looking man you know i used to look so horrible so horrible it's not funny so i thought no i want to be a woman why the hell am i dying why the hell am i suffocating myself i might just transcend you know transgender and then that's how i uh, you know trans uh, went into a trance and changed my whole personality that's how i changed my name Sylvester Dr Sylvester Rogers to Dr Silvy Rogers I cut Sylvester to Silvy and I went into uh, uh I did my of course I did the, my breast job and I, of course I um, uh and I, I started with the breast first and then I went on to become a proper trans uh, woman and then America I realized oh there are trans women there are transgenders and that's when I learned first okay so when you came back to India in the late 80s you came back as Silvy Rogers yes Okay. How did India accept you at that time, Silvi? What were the challenges then? If at all. Um I have to be honest with you before going to um uh, to England before I had a I had a year and a, I had a year almost 10 months to a year in Delhi where I was doing my uh, diploma in Kathak dancing from Bharatiya Kala Kendra. Oh yes. So I Delhi yeah. good 10 to 11 months almost a year I think. I think so yes it was in a, uh, it was in uh, beginning of 80s the beginning of 80s right and right and I did a course from there uh, a diploma course in Tatha Kem folk dance of India that period was the worst in my whole life because you know when I went to a market because I was not trans I hadn't changed my personality I was looking like a boy 
an ugly looking boy who walked like a woman who talked like a woman who behaved like a woman so you know people in those years and that you know found it very strange you know and i never hid it i was very open about what i wanted to talk like what i wanted to look like yeah you know and uh, people used to call me weird names like hey gandu hey jida hey angrez gandu hey and spit on my face also twice two people spat on me i'll never forget that all my born days and i used to come back to the hostel and cry and bitterly and call you know book a phone call to my mother in kolkata and i'd cry over the phone and those days we had to book a trunk call you know it was very difficult to get a trunk yeah. call and it was very expensive also and i was a, a student in in, in bharti kala kendra i was living on the premises so uh, it was it was you know there, there was a point where at that time i felt suicidal i felt like why am i living i should just finish my life and matters ended no one cries for more than a week so i thought uh, i might as well finish my life because this is ridiculous people are not letting me live so i might as well not live so it did become a suicidal thought at one point it did but when i went off to england i found it conservative there but people in england were much more educated much more conservative in their remarks much more um, people have a point to the thing that you did knew what you were they would move away from you and snigger and show you a, a dirty face but they would not say to you face oh you fucking homo you fucking fag they would not say these words you know they would not say these harsh terms yeah. they would just look at you yeah they look at you and just move on and because i was in a very noble profession i mean nurse so there was a lot of respect to balance it out there was a lot of balance there so it was i felt things were getting better but when i moved to uh, to the us i thought oh probably this is the best place but and mind you contradicting myself at that time i found us the best place now i find england the best place i am not fond of us anymore because i have been traveling so much in this 45 years of my life that i i think oh no it's boring i i rather go to england and come back for a holiday you know it's like that but actually us can kind of liberate my mind a lot and then i realized no nothing's wrong with me something's wrong with the people out there is their minds that are blocked not my mind i think they have to learn to accept me so when i came back back to your question when i came back to india i came back looking like a woman i mean not a beautiful woman but a, okay a ordinary nice young woman you know very young and um, you know and by that by that time i learned the art of makeup i learned the course of hair and makeup so i learned to groom myself up and so people found me attractive and people didn't um, snigger but yes when i became when i joined the industry bollywood industry I started with all the film stars hair and all that then of course when, when my name grew till today till today i'm connected with bollywood and connected with all the top most stars and top most people and i have my own salons uh the the, the immense amount of respect now the whole industry calls me mama they treat me like mama like i'm a big mama of the industry they love me they it's a different story today but of course don't forget times have changed a lot acceptance has come in tolerance has come in a lot in our time there was no tolerance which is very sad that we have to go to such a tough period so silvi i'm i'm glad that the, the the tolerance is there but you know before i come to my question about the current state in india i mean you know you said now that you're very very comfortable you prefer being in india as well which is i think a great achievement for the nation but what do you think has changed since 89 to now that has brought the transformation in because i always found it very strange that transgenders and all these things have been part of our culture our heritage we have artwork of these on our in our temples and everything it is only after the british came to india that they founded a sin based on the values of the god that they believed in you know so i don't know but what has happened since 89 to now silvi you think that has brought this change in india towards transgenders uh, to what i hear from the from the younger generation and the younger queens who are, have a lot of friends out here now who are most of my friends most of them are to what i hear from them it's total change of generation also don't forget um they keep saying that mama you're the first one thank god you opened the roads for us thank god you made things more easy for us thank god you made everything so acceptable for us because of you people are understanding us now so they seem to see feel that i'm they they seem to feel that i'm a icon for them i'm a diva for them that i open roads for them i made things but more easier but what i see from my point of view is it's not silly it's not me that one person can change everything no 
it's uh, it's uh, basically it's the era that has changed you know acceptance is coming with pa- time and patience and with that with the era keep changing and the years keep moving on with sci- technology gone so far you know so people are more easy acceptable because they feel um now they they are part of our, our, our community we have to accept that there's no choice we just in their faces you get my point so there there is a lot of change a huge change a huge change now i see the gay community they have big dalis and big beard and they are wearing nose rings and red lipstick and going to a party and nobody sniggers nobody looks at them even nobody even sniggers and like, i'm surprised now that excuse me <laughs> is this fashionable you know so i guess Times have changed. Times have changed. No, but the thing is, okay. Um, do you think the acceptance is superficial, or is it really at a human value? No, it's partly. It's partially superficial, for yeah. sure, for sure, and it's partly natural. From it comes naturally from some. Yes, some have open-heartedly accepted the community. Yes, there is there is superficiality in it for sure. because it takes all kind of fingers to make a hand so i do feel there are people who say something on your face and do something behind your back so that's always going to be there to god because um, uh, there are going to be you know your enemies like there's god there's also satan so it's the same thing so there is there has to be a, you know an opposition party so i guess that's good in a way it makes things better for us it makes things better to you know move on it's okay 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 see me look now uh being a straight individual that i am okay um you know i always joke about the fact that i was born a man i'm a caveman i like walking around my boxer shorts burping in public and i'm comfortable with that but i'm also very very big on the fact that i have to respect everyone around me yeah this world is mine as much as it is anybody else's what do you think keeping aside the superficial official folk from a human level what do you think we need to do to be able to respect each other and learn to live with each other and love each other for who we are see uh to god the first thing comes from parenting yeah correct if we parents don't teach our children that everybody's equal and everybody's lovable and everybody's cuddleable then only will this world change here back home in india what happens is we make so much of our sons and we make so little of our daughters when they're small when they're growing up so what happens is the son feels he's a king he can get out into the world and do what he wants to do say what he wants to say and that's why that's where it comes in the problem of uh, a complex in the person so it has to start from parenting parents have to learn to accept and there are many mothers who don't accept their children when they get to know they're gay i wonder why it's not the child's fault that they give birth to these children the children didn't fall from heaven in a basket so i can't get the point out here so i seem to see that um, parenting is a very important thing like my mother stood by me she never made me feel abnormal she wow. never threw me out of the house she never said oh you fucking fag and no she said you're perfectly okay you're normal for me you oh, normal uh, son go and wear a dress you have to wear so i think parental will make a big difference to god if mothers and parents learn to love their children and when they grow up they accept the children the way they are it will make a huge difference to everybody not the community it will make a huge difference to everybody there's a beautiful saying from the bible is love thy neighbor as thyself like the way you love yourself love thy neighbor but this is not taught this is not practical they only love themselves their home they throw the kachra on the neighbor's house but they won't keep it in front of their house it's like that so back home we need to teach our children we need to educate our kids you know you 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 uh, quoted the bible or beat any scripture for that matter right love thy love thy neighbor as you love the, love thyself but at the same time it is this hypocritical people who go into shrines who have the biggest problem with the gays and the lesbians and the lgbts and the queers and the transgenders right so what would you say to them because the argument that i hear from them is god made man and woman who are we to change that what's your take on that sylvia i really want to know I'm 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 not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're right at all by the way. But as you know, you, you know uh, this more than I have by the way. You know to God, there's uh, certain things we can change in our life which is to our capability of changing. Yeah. And there are certain things that we try our best to change and never change 
like they say a leopard can never change its spots you get it yeah right? so like that i tell you like that um, it's very um, difficult to change a hypocrite a hypocrite will remain a hypocrite you know you can't change him or her they 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 believe like that all their lives and they're the ones who end up the saddest and they're the ones who end up in depression because they're hypocrites they're living trying to live two lives they're trying to say something else here they're trying to do something else there and you know i guess uh, um um they, they're the ones who end up in, in depressed states because you, you're going to you're going to your month then you're going to shine and you're praying to god and you're saying you're a good person you're showing the world you go regularly you're showing the world but back home you're abusing your neighbor and saying oh he's a fucking bag and oh he's an asshole so these things you can't change and uh, it's impossible to change them unless they go through a certain hatsa kuch ho jati hai unko to fir then they learn the lesson they say okay they feel there's no karma they can karma catches up with them then they realize oh they were hypocrites but have you been subjected to any of this sort of abuse that i just mentioned oh very common yes of course and, and, and how do you handle it silvi i ignore them I feel like this should be ignored that's it okay so okay no fair i think i think that's that's the perfect answer and i i, I agree with you to as you say to each their own okay to absolutely to each their own and i also personally believe that this whole using religion and god to fight a battle is wrong in at every level okay and i i'm i'm glad that you survived all of this i'm i'm glad that you've actually you know I, I, it's it's sad that you've had to go through it but you've survived it and as some of your younger queens have said to you you are the one who's actually opened the door for many people in india you really have been that person you've been that individual who's made it happen okay yeah now yeah. and so i just wanted to ask you then let's talk about current day what's a day in the life like for silvi rogers ah uh, normally uh, i wake up and uh, obviously um I have to hit the kitchen first because I have a I have my husband at home. I have to first cook the food for the house. Then I get into my salon and I clean up my salon. And I'm ready for my clientele. And then of course in the evening I put my stilettos on. I'm ready for a party. Mm-hmm. And the day moves on. I have to party for sure. Of course, yeah, I've heard that about you as well. But I'll come to that in a minute, Silvi. So my my question now to you is that what. do we need to do let's just say as a nation as india as a society of the world what do we need to do to be more respectful yeah i know you said it's all it's all got to do with the upbringing i understand that but today of 30 year old 40 year old 50 year old man in as you mentioned india as you mentioned india as you mentioned as our nation i would request um, I would request the government to be more liberal with the laws, make the laws more lenient towards this particular community, and of course, uh, learn to you know. I don't understand why they don't uh, you know open more social places for people to meet and explain themselves, express themselves more. People still have to hide. People still have to camouflage. It's not as it's open as an open. There is a change. There's but it is much better. But there are still people who are in, in corporate offices who still don't tell the office people they're gay in India back home. So you see, now the laws are being uh, the laws are changing slowly. They have scrapped three seventy seven. They have scrapped certain laws. Things are much better. So you see, uh, I think uh, uh, a leader in India, a leader has to be more liberal and um, more younger in thoughts. so that we live with the generation coming up we need to live with the coming generation we can't live in our own bubble and keep saying no no it was like that in our times it doesn't work but silvi is that a political change or a cultural change that's needed because the two both, different things both both it's both it's cultural and political because see back home here cultural everybody does what they want to do anyways we are one of the most 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 democratic country in the world and we have the most the biggest largest largest population in the world so i just feel because of our democracy we do what we want to do so culturally we are allowed to do what we want to do politically something is right and something is wrong and why wrong why wrong that's my question to the leader why wrong yeah but i think we we're, we're evolving silvi and to be fair i mean you know uh, uh, in recent times a lot of things have changed i yes. mean 
things have yeah. changed. We have to understand that. But yes, I agree with you as well. There's a long way to go for us. But I think our biggest challenge is not a political challenge. Our biggest challenge is our cultural challenge. Yes, I yes. really believe that. I think yes. culturally, as you said, it starts with the mothers raising their children, yes. the parents raising their children correctly. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's acceptance. And, you know, um, we have to accept each other, not hypocritically, but from the human soul itself. Yes. Correct, correct. I, I think, and I think that we, we're on the path for that. So that's the whole transgender conversation, Sidhu, and I think there's nobody can speak about it better than you. Uh, let's come to the second thing I want to talk to you now. For the person that you are, you know, uh, you, you've gone through a sexual identity uh, transformation, and so to speak, and you're living very happily, and I'm so happy for you. What's this addiction about happiness and being so happy? and making everybody around you happy. What is this madness about? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know how to put it in words. Are you just a party girl? Or is this genuine uh, happiness? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm honest with you. I'll be honest with you as I have the Lord watching over me. I'm genuinely very, very happy because uh, I feel... Um, I did what I wanted to do with my life. I lived my life on my terms. I'm still living it on my terms. And um, uh, I have nothing to look back to and uh, cry or regret. I have no regrets in my life except the loss of my mother. But otherwise, I feel uh, I'm always happy because I feel um, uh, there's no point. I mean, I don't know. There's no point. The only time I'm sad and depressed is, uh, you know, when uh, I see death around me, when I see sadness around me, when I see, you know, people are suffering and we can't help them. That's the only time I feel a little bad, but otherwise, nothing really bothers me. I move on and I'm a happy soul and nothing bothers me, nothing. Everybody who's worked with you, under you as your staff, who have your peers, everybody, you adopt them like your children. You, yes. You help them settle in life, you help them form a business, you help them get married. What explain the rationale behind that to me? Uh, it's as simple as this, Tagore. You know, when we were kids, there were things that certain things like we never had cycles, we never had chocolates, we never had sweets because of the poorness of our parental. We were very, very poor. We were one of the poorest families of Kolkata. So we never had these these things in our lives, chocolates and sweets and you know, which other children had. And uh, we never had a cycle also to cycle, which normal children had. So that's one reason today I cannot cycle. When I was in Holland, everybody was taking cycles out in Amsterdam and, I, and my friend said, why are you not taking a bike? I said, because I can't cycle. <laughs> because I never cycled all my life. I never owned a cycle. But today, by God's grace, I have everything in my life. So when I see a generation, uh, when I can afford it and when I can, uh, like the other day also, just two, three days back, my manager's son said, um, Papa, I have to walk one hour to my tuition, one hour back, one hour there, two hours I spend walking. A second and cycle the lado. So I overheard the conversation. So because I overheard the conversation, he never knew I heard it. I told him, get the car out, let's get into the car to go and do some work and straight to the cycle shop and bought the child a cycle because, not because I had the money or I wanted to show off, no. I wanted to tell him that they go, because of his two hours he's wasting, he can sit there two hours more and learn more and he can become better off instead of walking there, going two hours. So it's just trying to make things a little easier, a little more comfortable, especially where education is concerned. So it's like, uh, I feel what we never got as children. And now that we can give it, why not? We cannot take everything with us and go. We cannot take anything with us and go. So as a child, my mother always taught us, this is why I love my mother. She always said, share your last coin with your best friend, with everybody, share it. So it's just embedded in us as kids, even though we never saw coins in those days. <laughs> Okay, so my last two questions, Sylvie. Question number one, what would be your message to the new generation of transgenders? To live and let live. To live and let live, yeah. Be honest to yourself, to live and let live. Absolutely. And your message to the non-trans people like myself, what would you say to us? You know, uh, it's very... Uh, it's very cynical for me to say be more passionable, be more yeah. uh, you know, passionate and be yeah. very uh, 
a liberal with us, be more liberated with us, be more, uh, you know, try and get more comfortable with us. But saying these things really don't matter. What uh, I would like to say to the entire straight world is that, that uh, you know, wake up and smell the roses. You do have neighbors. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. Okay, and my last question to you, my dear Sylvie. What do you want the world to remember you for? My smile. Your smile. And being a party girl. <laughs> that won't go. <laughs> <laughs> that won't go. Sylvie, no. as I said, I mean, I could talk to you for another podcast about all the struggles that you've gone in your life and for about all the achievements that you've done. But I think, thank you so much for talking to me on my podcast. You're welcome. God bless you. And do keep in touch though. I will definitely keep in touch. As you know, we have common friends. Let's not mention her name again. <laughs> but yes, and she does shout at me as well. So I... <laughs> okay, darling. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sylvie. Stay blessed. Bye. God bless you.